Okay, so um, today's talk is about the Australian Characterization Commons at Scale project. Uh, you, may have, you may have heard about it um, several times, depending on um, where you are, if your facility or university is involved in it. But um, I want to talk about it because Microscopy Australia is involved in this project, and there are definitely outcomes that will benefit all of the facilities across Microscopy Australia, whether your facility or university is involved in the ACCS project or not. Um, so what I will give briefly is an overview of the project and the first outcomes that are directly um, beneficial to the facilities. So the uh, ACCS project, so that means Australian Characterization Commons at Scale, um, is a project funded by the Australian Research Data Commons, um, the ARDC, which is an increased capability like Microscopy Australia, and it has co-investment from 10 universities um, nationwide and three other increased facilities. Um, it's a very large project, so. Uh, that is running for about two years and a half, and the project started um, last year, mid last year, but there has been some delays in some aspects of the project, um, mostly due to COVID. So the ACCS is uh, quite a vast and diverse uh, program of work. Um, it has three main aims. Uh, one is to develop a coherent and accessible um, informatics landscape for all facilities. Um, much broader than microscopy itself. It's basically for whole of characterization. Um, the second aim is to deploy a characterization commons for researchers and facilities. Um, that is quite important, building a community with common tools um, as standards. And the third aim is to create a rich ecosystem of computing system, repositories, workflows, and services. Um, it is really a project which is um, directed to the facilities and their users and to make their work uh, easier. So the work can range from more um, IT work, which is like storage or transfer of data, but it's also data processing, data analysis, um, data curation, data sharing, a lot of aspects uh, are covered. The ACCS also includes three specialized programs, uh, which are more focused on some disciplines or areas of research. One is big data, electron and correlative microscopy. One is on biomedical imaging and one is on uh, scattering and much more than scattering and it's basically developing tools nationally for scattering. So um, those three aims and three specialized programs um, translate into seven work packages, um, which um, partly reflect uh, the three uh, specialized programs. I have uh, highlighted them in color. So briefly, the seven work packages are about um, work package one, which is more IT um, focused, which is the deployment and the operation of models for the commons. Work package two is about um, data provenance uh, of research data. Work package three is about training and uh, community building um, as part of the ACCS and to have that lasting. Work package four is the work package um, on uh, big data, electron and qualitative microscopy. What's very important in this work package is to de it's dealing with the increasing amount of data generated by EM and qualitative microscopy. Work package five is on bio biomedical imaging and work package six is on um, scattering and beyond. Work package, work package seven is project management and importantly, the sustainability of the outcomes of the ACTS project. We don't want things to be available and working well until the end of the project, until the funding of the project, and then things basically are not working anymore or tools not being uh, available uh, or accessible anymore. Uh, I will focus my talk on Work Package 4 on uh, outcomes that we have so far from Work Package 4. The stakeholders of Work Package 4 are Microscopy Australia, Monash University, University of Wollongong, University of Queensland, Arnett, and the University of Western Australia. Uh, and Microsoft Australia has been quite involved in this work package. Um, but briefly first, what has the ACCS been doing or what is ACCS aiming for? Um, and more concretely, so what we want is to deploy a federated CVL desktop environment. So if you're not familiar with the CVL, it's the characterization virtual laboratory. Um, if you want more information about the CVL, if you don't know what the CVL is, or if you've heard of it, but you don't know much about it, um, feel free to send me an email, or if you've been in touch with Catherine, Catherine Hall at UQ, uh, you can drop her an email and there will be 
uh, a webinar later this year or maybe earlier next year on CVL for Microscopy Australia users and facility staff. Um, with the ACCS, we also want to deploy web-based tools and software. We want to help researchers use um, informatics tools um, using so mean um, making them accessible or making them more accessible or to have them know that they exist. We want to improve interoperability uh, between the different data formats and standards that are being used. Um, we want to build community, that's an integral part of the SCCS. We want to integrate instruments in data workflows, for example, so that they're more efficient. Um, training is a big important is a big part also of the ACCS. There is no point in developing tools or making tools more accessible if in the end people can't really use them or if they don't know how powerful those tools are. Um, and as I said, sustainability is very important um, in the ACCS project. So we, we, we're working directly in um, partnership with the institutions to make sure that everything that is developed out of the, out of the ACCS lives um, continues to live um, when the ACCS uh, project um, is um, finished. But what I'll, do for, what I'll do for the rest of the webinar is focused on Work Package 4, where, um, in which I've been involved and which has direct uh, benefit to Microscopy Australia users and um, facility staff. And that one is focused on EM and correlative microscopy. In particular, um, how to deal with large amounts of data um, that um, newest instruments tend to generate. So I've just um, alluded to it. So why Work Package 4? What's the premise for a work package like that one? It's basically the newest uh, microscopy techniques um, and instruments, they come with new challenges. And one is the ever, ever increasing volumes of data that are being created. Uh, acquisition speed also tends to increase and that can pose real challenge in terms of data capture and data storage. Um, data processing requirements also um, become more and more problematic when you have to deal with large amounts of data. And there's also a lack of standardization in data formats and metadata formats too. So that can be quite a, of a problem when you want to have your data interoperable, for example, when you want to use different kinds of um, programs to process or analyze your data, or maybe just for um, long-term storage of your data to make sure that, for example, they continue to follow fair principles. So with Work Package 4, we have two main aims. The first one is to develop tools, platforms, guidelines, and standards. And more importantly, we want to develop them, but we want people to use them. So we want to deploy the tools and the platforms whenever and wherever possible. And we want to have the guidelines and the standards developed in Work Package 4, adopted, uh, adopted by um, our partners in Work Package 4 and beyond. It's not only for the ACC, it's for the whole community um, in Australia and beyond. Um, first, I'd like to introduce uh, the team of Work Package 4. Um, they've all been working very hard. There's Wong at University of Queenstown, there's Jay at Monash University, there's Josh at University of Wollongong, and there's Chris at Arnett. I'm really presenting their work. Uh, I've, I coordinate the work in Work Package 4, but what I'm presenting is really um, the, the fruit of their work. So what, first, I will describe um, how we've come to um, the uh, deliverables um, that are being delivered now in Work Package 4, because that basically kept us busy for um, six, seven months last year. Um, so first in Work Package 4, there was a discovery phase where we reviewed um, the uh, informatics landscape in the country and overseas. And based on that review, we made recommendations to the ACCS stakeholders on what we thought was interesting to investigate further in the ACCS uh, Work Package 4 program. Then um, we consulted with stakeholders to know what they thought of the recommendations, whether they thought it was a bit useless or not, or whether they thought it would be very fruitful to their facilities or to the community. And then we determined the deliverables based on the consultation. And after that, uh, we started working basically on these deliverables and deliver. Two main deliveries so far that you may have, may have heard of, there's Globus and there's Pitchy or Cloud or Four Seed, depending um, um, who you've been to, talking to. So first, the discovery phase. So the goal of the discovery phase uh, was twofold. The first was to produce a report that reviewed the tools and the methods uh, used by the facilities um, in the country, but mostly the facilities um, that had EM instruments 
that uh, generated large amounts of data. Now, it's electron microscopy, even the work package for uh, so called um, covers uh, multimodal uh, correlative instruments, but um, that ha we, we haven't met any uh, a facility in the country so far that had, for example, um, issues with CLEM or just operated a CLEM. Um, and then out of that review, we made recommendations on priorities of work for Work Package 4. Um, again, to help the facilities um, handle the large amounts of data that they were facing. And the information that um, we used um, in that review uh, was collected through interviews of facilities in the country, uh, but also overseas. Uh, and all of those facilities uh, operate instruments that generate, that generate large amounts of data. So in total, in that discovery uh, review, there were eight Australian facilities and two facilities overseas. So you can see here they are in purple. We interviewed many more uh, facilities and they showed um, here in um, light um, purple. Um, they will be included in a review that we aim to uh, have published um, sometime later next year. But basically you can see you, we interviewed all of the facilities in Microscopy Australia. We interviewed many of the link labs in Microscopy Australia and we interviewed um, uh, facilities in the US and in Europe um, that are um, uh, quite um, well known um, in the field. So for, for the discovery phase, so we interviewed facilities and what we wanted is to have that approach to be as systematic and as objective as possible. So what we did is we ran the interviews using a, a standard uh, set of questions. Um, all the uh, facilities were interviewed following the same um, set of questions. And those questions covered a very broad range of aspects about data, um, the data workflow and data management. So that was data capture, data transfer, data orchestration, work, movement of data in general, how they process their data, both uh, software and hardware, how they store the data and data management, including metadata. FAIR is one of the aspects that we have in Work Package 4 too, so uh, metadata um, is important too. Now, the instruments that a lot of those facilities uh, operate and cited as uh, potentially problematic in terms of uh, generation of large amounts of data were basically SEM, TEM and CloudTEM, FIPSEM, STEM and extra microscopy. Um, now, as I said before, um, CLEM, for example, was not mentioned because none of the facilities that we interviewed either operate a CLEM or um, they didn't cite it as an instrument that was posing problems in particular because of the large volumes of data. So this uh, review was not a systematic, exhaustive or detailed review of all the tools and methods used by the facilities, far from that. We didn't have the time anyway to do that. Um, and then from that review, we wrote a report and we uh, articulated that report around four main um, items, um, data movement, data processing, data management, and data orchestration. Like for data management, again, we included data documentation and description using metadata and persistent identifiers. It's very important to us. Um, and the report considered both um, software and hardware uh, because sometimes to be able to run a piece of software, you need to make sure that you have the right piece of hardware, the right infrastructure to support it. Um, the findings of all of the interviews were summarized and assessed, critically assessed. Critically assessed, that, that does not mean it was negative. It was like, positive, like pros and cons to see where things were doing really well and where things could be improved. Uh, look like we, we, we all know that all facilities try to do their best, but sometimes, you know, um, uh, some facilities may be um, uh, reaching a bottleneck in how they um, um, the handling their data and we try to find solutions to help them. Uh, it's important to recognize when the bottleneck um, is, is, is occurring or, and why it's occurring. And from that, from that review, we made recommendation for the ACCS stakeholders. If you want to know more about that final report, it's been published online. It's um, in open access and you can find it on Zenodo. Um, and if you want to have um, the DOI to, to that um, report, please feel free to drop me an email and I will redirect you um, to, to the link. Uh, it was also communicated in a previous newsletter of Microscopy Australia, so you can also find it there. Now, the tank home message of the discovery phase was basically, you know, all the facilities that we interviewed in Australia and overseas, whether they're big, whether they're large, whether they're specialized or whether they're multidisciplinary, they all face similar challenges, in particular, how you deal with 
amounts of data that seem to be bigger and bigger and how you process such a large amount of data. And there was a surprising, I mean, not so surprising, but I was very pleased to see that there was a great interest by all, shared by all the facilities in the review. Really, all the facilities are really looking like how we can do better and how are the others doing, um, not in a way, a com competitive way, but really to know, uh, is there a better way to, to do what we do? Uh, are other, have other facilities experimented um, other ways to handle the data, to process the data, to store the data that maybe would be more efficient or more time effective for um, their facilities. And for the ACCS project, one of the main outcomes um, was to develop a common understanding of um, big data um, microscopy requirements um, and to develop priorities, uh, obviously, for um, the rest of the web package. So once we had that review done, uh, we consulted with all of the stakeholders of uh, Work Package 4 to see what they thought of our 12 recommendations, 14 recommendations, sorry. Um, and that was the first step in uh, determining the deliverables for Work Package 4. So we interviewed um, Arnett, Microscopy Australia, Monash University, University of Wollongong, University of Queenstown, and University of Western Australia. And basically, we asked them three things for each of the 14 recommendations out of the review. For each recommendation, we asked, do you think it, is, it has a strategic priority for your organization? Is it valuable to your, organiz to your organization? And um, can you, if, if we were to work on that recommendation right now, would you be able to deliver, deliver in terms of staff, but also in terms of resources, maybe like infrastructure needed? Uh, that's very important if you want to be able to deliver this year. Uh, many of the things that we proposed. Now, you may think that strategic and value are a bit um, redundant. In fact, they're not. For example, if you consider FAIR, you may consider FAIR is definitely valuable, but FAIR may be more like a long-term goal that you have for your facility. Right now, you, you, FAIR is more like a stepwise process. So first, you may need to work on some aspects of how you store your data, how you handle your data on your journey to FAIR. So that is more strategic but FAIR is more valuable on the long term. Um, and then um, based on the consultations, uh, we propose deliverables to the steering committee. Um, and those so uh, to the, the, the determination of the deliverables um, try, followed an um, objective, uh, a set of objective criteria, basically. It was very important. Um, to basic so, so that it was not it didn't seem biased to favor or disfavor uh, a stakeholder, for example, or a, a type of objective that maybe not all stakeholders had agreed before. Um, and basically, the, each deliverable was based on whether the recommendations that we had, the 14, which ones were the most um, strategic for all of the institutions, and more importantly, uh, whether they were able to deliver now. And, um, and each deliverable was given um, a lead, um, which is important for responsibility and accountability for the project. And in the end, we have out of the 14 recommendations, we have 12 deliverables for 2021 in four areas, data transport and automation, computer and tools, data management. And we still have a review on the informatics landscape, which will be based on the discovery uh, report that we have already published. So now we'll talk uh, about the first outcomes that we have um, out of Work Package 4. Um, we have quite a lot of work at the moment within Work Package 4. Um, as I said, we are going, we're working on an academic review based on the discovery report, which like the discovery report will be available in open access. Um, so we also worked on, uh, we've also worked on uh, data transport. Uh, a service which is um, basically uh, faster and uh, more reliable. We are also working on uh, optimizing and automating workflows for data movement wherever possible, because we found in the in the interviews that a lot of facilities were still doing a lot of things uh, manually that can take time, that is prone to errors too. So whenever possible, let's optimize and automate workflows. Um, we also found that baselining and benchmarking file transfer was also um, an issue for many of the facilities, sometimes because they don't really know how their network behaves or they don't really know how to benchmark a network. Um, again, I like, you know facilities are not like they don't really have heaps of necessarily of IT staff within the facilities to support them. So for some facilities, it may seem very basic, but it is not. Um, 
Many of the facilities are primarily staffed with scientists, uh, not with IT specialists. Um, another aspect of work is basically prototyping and illustrating data management software. Um, in particular, when you deal with large amounts of data, um, being able to manage your data um, efficiently is very important. And another aspect is developing guidelines, basically, uh, on data retention and data disposal. What I will, what I will um, present today is only three of the, outcome, three of the current outcomes. Um, first one is on data transport. Second one is on auto optimizing and automating workflows for data movement. And the third one is about data management service. So data transport service, you may have heard about it. It's the work on Globus. So um, Jay at Monash University, Josh at Wollongong, University of Wollongong, and Chris at Arnett have um, worked on the, on the deployment, testing and deployment of Globus. And that work was uh, led by Jay at Monash University. Now you may have heard about Globus, but briefly, what's Globus? Uh, that's a data movement service, which was developed by the University of Chicago. It's, I mean, they like, Globus like saying it in their promotional materials, but basically it's a data transport service developed by researchers for researchers. They really, uh, the, the, the core business is um, data movement for um, research data. Globus transfers data efficiently, that's an important aspect, securely and reliably um, between sites, which like Globus performs better when sites are not too close, whether it's locally, nationally, or internationally. By too close, what I mean, if for example, you're based at Melbourne, you're based in Melbourne and you want to transfer data between MIPS and Monash University, maybe Globus will not reach its full potential. But if you want to transfer data between University of Melbourne and University of Wollongong or between University of Melbourne and JCU, Globus may be uh, much better for that because it definitely has some advantages. So with Globus, uh, so in, in Globus languages, um, uh, you transfer data between endpoints and um, you can transfer data for different kinds of um, storage systems and devices, can be HPC compute servers, can be uh, personal workstations, personal laptops, can be data storage, uh, physical data storage or cloud storage. You can also transfer data, data directly from an instrument. And then you transfer the data to a um, storage uh, point, which is um, located um, distantly. And Globus basically handle the transfer between the two endpoints. And as you can see in this slide, Globus is used globally by many um, uh, facilities, many researchers, um, many countries. So it's, it, it's, it's quite a reliable um, piece of software. Um, that is worth uh, investigating and deploying in the country. Um, so as I said, Globus has a number of advantages. And as, as I said, it's secure, reliable, um, but it has other advantages. For example, you have an access, you have access to a global uh, network of endpoints and data collections. Um, you, can, uh, you can also um, log into your, your Globus using your, um, um, ORCID, uh, but also you can use a, a number of other IDs, either, for example, Google, but also you can use EDU game, which is like a federation of um, access. Um, in, in Australia, it's via um, uh, the Australian Access Federation. Um, that means that you don't need to create um, heaps of new logins every time you want to connect to another, to a new endpoint. You can use just your uh, university credentials and they will be recognized. Um, and with, with the, the whole network of Globus uh, endpoints, you can transfer data to many different uh, locations, to third-party transfers, um, third-party storage. For example, you can transfer to Dropbox, to Microsoft Azure, Microsoft OneDrive, AWS, um, Google Cloud, and many other uh, commercial um, storage facilities. Um, you have different kinds of uh, interface. You have a web interface, you have an API, and you have a command line uh, also interface. All of that really allows you to integrate Globus into your uh, workflow, in an automated workflow, for example. Now, we, the work that was done in Work Package 4 on Globus was basically um, testing uh, Globus. Uh, whether it was really um, delivering uh, all of the promises. So for that, uh, Monash University set up two endpoints, 
and University of Wollongong set up one endpoint. And Arnett had an endpoint in Melbourne. And basically what they did is they transferred data between, between those three um, organizations and they um, checked whether it was um, like first how to install it because it's not as trivial um, and whether it was um, uh, fast and whether some settings in Globus would allow you to, to, to transfer data um, even faster. So as an example, and all the tests were done with a standard um, data set, which is like 500 gigabytes um, provided by Arnet. And you can see like, for example, in a transfer from Arnet to Massive, so Monash University in Victoria, they could reach speed of about one gig um, per second, which is when you're considering data sets that are maybe like hundreds of gigs or even more, it's quite, um, it's quite interesting. And it's, it can be way faster than R-Sync or FTP or SFTP, or if you're using, for example, something like a FileZilla or Qt FTP. Uh, and now the, the testing of Globus has been conclusive and now it's operational at the University of Wollongong and at Monash University. Um, other partners of Work Package 4, like UQ and UWA, are currently deploying uh, Globus. Uh, we've written a report on the work on Globus, so you can find it here um, on the Nodo. Um, again, if you want to have uh, the link to, 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 the, to the report, feel free to, to send me an email and I will give you the DOI. Now, also, just so you know, Arnet is also running a, a, a trial program on Globus for the whole uh, country. Um, and a number of universities and in general like organizations in the country are involved in this trial program. So your university may not be involved in the ACCS or Work Package 4, but your university may still be trialing um, Globus. So the best that I can advise in this case is um, contact your local IT or central IT department and ask them whether they're testing Globus and whether maybe you could have an endpoint um, set up at your facility so that you can also um, use it and test it. Now, a second aspect of the work in Work Package 4 I'd like to present is um, done by Josh at University of Wollongong and it's about data movement um, and how you can optimize and automate it uh, whenever possible and wherever possible. And in this work, there's a focus uh, on um, moving data from instrument storage to facility storage and from facility storage to, to local compute, including um, HPC. Um, and that is actually quite a neat piece of work because it really shows that you know, you, whenever you uh, have your workflow set up for data movement, sometimes you may need to update it um, to, to keep it basically, um, to, 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 take, to be able to take advantage of recent de technological developments in IT, for example. Um, now, if you consider the, 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 the legacy tools or scripts or settings that you're using at your facility with um, newer approaches, you see that um, there are pros and cons to everything, but I will just show the pros of um, legacy and, and newer approaches. Now, when you use, for example, uh, legacy tools or scripts and settings that you have at your facility, in general, because they've been there for quite some time, sometimes for decades, uh, they're quite familiar to the users and to the staff at the facility. Sometimes, not always, uh, but hopefully quite often, they're quite well documented and you have guides available, guides for, for the staff, for the users, for the researchers, either uh, available locally at the facility or maybe just available online. You know, if you Google it, you know that um, you're going to find heaps of information on it online. Sometimes um, those scripts that are used are quite simple. Uh, they can be quite versatile and they can be easy to modify. Um, they often not always cover all common platforms, so Windows, Linux, and Macs, and they can be quite portable. So basically, you know, they've been there for quite a while. They work well. You know when they don't work so well, but, you know, um, they, they're good enough. Now, what's the pros of newer tools or scripts or settings? It generally, they are more advanced, and they may be more suitable to uh, more recent um, technologies or standards that you'll be using, either hardware or software. For example, if you have a tool to transfer data um, that was set up like 10, 15, 20 years ago, maybe you're not really taking advantage of um, high-speed networks that universities operate now. It's something to consider. Um, and sometimes those newer approaches have a GUI interface or a visual interface, which is more user-friendly. 
So what Josh has done at University of Wollongong is basically, and, and, and demonstrated is basically by optimizing or rewriting some scripts, you can move data of the instrument to, to uh, facility storage, for example, more efficiently. And you can also optimize the storage uh, on your instrument. And, it's, and just by basically optimizing, tweaking scripts, tweaking workflows, his Josh managed to have almost near real time data transfer from instrument to facility storage. So, you know, it shows that you don't need to invest in a lot of hardware or like newer hardware, more expensive hardware and like very fancy, fancy things. Just optimize, maybe rewrite scripts when needed. And then you can you can you can have um, great achievements. Now, the future work uh, for data movement is basically to also um, test and deploy at, at least another site, not only Wollongong, and obviously always to document and train um, to show basically whenever possible, you know, how you can optimize or automate aspects in your workflows. And the last aspect that I want to show in Work Package 4 is the work done by Wang and Duyen at the University of Queensland on Pichi. So uh, PC um, has been deployed, he's being deployed at, the, at CMM, at UQ. So the objective of that work on uh, data, uh, of deploying a data management software was basically to have an end-to-end -end process. Um, basically, you capture and transfer your raw data um, to the storage um, collections. And you have the information synchronized with your local booking system. So at CMM, they're using PPMS. And another objective was that this data management software would also be used for data ingestion. And because uh, we are all on a journey to FAIR, you want to have a data management software that is as compatible with FAIR as possible, but also that will enable you on your journey to FAIR. So you need to harvest um, metadata as much as possible. Um, and automatically, whenever possible, we try to have things automated and not to have um, manual intervention or not too much manual intervention. And it has to be simple uh, as possible for users and facility staff basically to deposit data. You don't want someone to have a lot of experience in IT to be able to use the software. That's key if you want to have wide um, adoption. So. Um, at CMM, what we've uh, gone for is for a uh, data management service uh, based on Clouda. So Clouda is an open source data management framework uh, developed at uh, University of Illinois uh, at Urbana-Champaign. And uh, the um, local flavor of Clouda uh, at CMM is called Pichi. Now, the advantages of Clouda is that it has powerful search capabilities across space that has said that has said and find them. So you can really find your data um, easily. There's, there's you, if you have like folders and subfolders and sub subfolders, you can search your data. You can also search over metadata. So that's quite important. So for example, if you, if one of the metadata, for example, is the name of um, the sample or the name of the user, you can find all of, and of, co of course, you've collected the metadata on that. You can find all of the data generated by a given user or related to a given sample. Uh, another important aspect, as I said, is automation. So extracting metadata in an automatic way is important. It has to be able to support many file times and it has to be possible to add new extractors. And again, it has to be straightforward, not something really, really complicated that needs to have extensive changes maybe in the, in the code of Cloud to be able to um, add new extractors. And it has to be flexible for data ingestion. So Cloud basically um, had all of those advantages. So CMM decided to uh, implement Cloud um, locally. And the local implementation, as I said, is called Peachy. So that is a simplified uh, overview of how Peachy is implemented at CMM. But basically, Peachy is three um, steps in the data management uh, workflow. It's Cloud itself. Um, then there's uh, an API. Uh, and then there's um, the Peachy client, which is directly uh, hooked on the uh, instrument on the um, um, on the computer basically that operates the instrument. And um, you can see that in, in that workflow that you can have, you have metadata that is being uh, harvested um, from various uh, sources, including from the booking system. From the booking system, you can harvest so much 
it would be a pity not to be able to collect that sort of information and to enrich your data with such metadata. And then uh, with Pitchy, you can have your data um, transferred um, on a cache storage called Medici at UQ, and then you can use all sorts of um, storage and compute um, to do your data processing, data storage, and data analysis. So um, as I said, PG is, be, is being um, deployed at CMM. Um, so it's a lot for all instruments, not only for electron microscopy and not only for big data um, EM. Um, and it's 71 instruments at CMM. So it's, that's quite a decent uh, rollout. It will take about six to eight months, so basically, hopefully until the end of this year. At the same time, it's important to minimize disruption of the services provided by CMM to their users. So the rollout will be progressive and the busiest uh, instruments and instruments that generate um, a lot of data will be done last because there will be more um, information, um, like I guess the trials and errors uh, enrich um, the local knowledge. So hopefully uh, CMM will be able to uh, handle um, better and better when uh, like whenever there are situations when maybe Peachy has problems, uh, they will learn on that. And what does it mean actually implementing Peachy or any other data management software uh, in, a, in a facility? Well, it may, it may mean first that you need to redesign your workflows to, to take advantage of the, of the different um, uh, functionalities in your data management software, but also um, to integrate it to your institutional infrastructure and to meet the expectations of all of your stakeholders. And stakeholders, um, so it may be the facility director, but also you know, all of the managers and the users um, in your facility. So that's a lot of people. Then you need to actually implement the tool and then you need to train and educate your users and your staff. So it's something that needs to be um, taken into account. Because it, it, it can really, it, on the long term, it's very beneficial to a facility. On the short term, you need to think about how you're changing basically um, your workflows within the facilities. So um, what's next in Work Package 4? Um, so for data transport, the work on Globus, um, there will be a webinar uh, open to the ACC stakeholders and Microscopy Australia and much uh, broadly. Um, on basically uh, what is Globus and what have we learned from Work Package 4. That will be scheduled sometime in September. There is a tentative date, but it will be communicated later when uh, that is confirmed. For Josh's work on optimizing and automating data movement, uh, the work is still in progress um, and there will be a report uh, available sometime later this year, October, October, November. We'll see how it goes. Um, now, Chris Myers at Arnet is also working on uh, baselining and benchmarking of file transfer per performance using a tool called Persona. Report is coming soon. And for the data management software, so Pitchy and Clouder, um, as I said, um, um, it's being deployed at University of Queensland at CMM. Um, the user's documentation and training is being developed too. And some other facilities I've heard are quite interested in Pitchy or Clouder. So maybe some uh, other facilities uh, we look into uh, deploying it. Now we're working on many other things currently in Work Package 4. One is a um, review and development of guidelines for data retention and data disposal. I am working on it actually. So I will contact uh, some of your facilities um, sometime soon, hopefully. The report is due in October. Um, now I'm also working on an academic publication based on the discovery report that I'm aiming for basically a manuscript submitted by the end of this year. Hopefully the manuscript will be submitted. Uh, no, sorry. I'm hoping for a manuscript finished by the end of this year. I'm also hoping that a manuscript will be submitted by the end of this year. But we'll see how it goes. Um, it's quite a lot of work. Um, and I'm also working on um, basically having a national common set of persistent identifiers. Uh, for um, data, and that is um, done within Microscopy Australia uh, under a pilot program that I'm setting up. And I need to contact some facilities for that that have expressed uh, some interest. Now, I'd like to acknowledge uh, all of the facilities and all of the staff at those facilities that have um, contributed and helped in many ways uh, at, um, for World Package 4. 
Um, I should mention that Wojtek Kosinski was supposed to talk, now he's not at Monash University anymore, he's at NIF. Um, also, I'd like to acknowledge all of the facilities that have greatly helped us by basically taking some time to answer our questions for the discovery report. So that's all of the people that we have interviews for that we have interviewed for the discovery report. So that's a lot of people. We really appreciate the time they've taken. We need to realize that the interviews really took something like the interview itself maybe was two hours, but maybe for um, in collecting information uh, by the facilities, maybe it was an extra one, two hours. So it's like a lot of work for each facility. We really appreciate that. Um, and that's the other facilities we interviewed. So you, you can see it's, it's many people who really appreciate it. And thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, and if you have any questions, um, feel free to ask now. <laughs>